Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Welcome to another episode of Arise. I'm grateful to have you joining me on this third Sunday of Advent. I can't believe this year has gone by so fast. Um, I can't believe we're already almost at Christmas. Do you guys feel this way too? Do you guys feel like the year just flew by or was it slow for you guys? I feel like with having Maverick and everything, I feel like it just kind of flew by. Crazy, 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 crazy. Okay, I'm gonna go to the Lord in prayer and then we will get started. Of course, there's construction. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day, Lord. I just give you so much praise and glory, God. Help us to know that we can come to you with anything, Lord. Your word says to lay our burdens down at your feet, God, that you are with us, you go before us, you see everything that we're going through, Lord. You walk with us through the fire. We so appreciate you, God. We just give you all the love in the world. We can never ever repay you for, for the sacrifice that you've been given to us. And we just sit in anticipation awaiting your arrival and what we celebrate this Christmas. And that's the birth of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, God. I thank you for everyone here watching, Lord. Please open up their hearts today. I pray they hear a word from you. I pray that I step aside and your word comes through me. God, I just, I just thank you again for this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. They're sawing something next door, but it is what it is, guys. Like I said, it's the third Sunday of Advent, and so we're still preparing for the arrival and the coming of our King, Jesus. And in order for us to know that we need a Savior, He is the Savior, He is the light of the world. In order for us to know that we need a Savior, we need to realize we need to be saved. I think so many people in the world don't realize, I talk about it a lot, their depravity and don't realize our need for salvation and a savior and for forgiveness of just how sinful and wretched we really are as humans. And, and you guys have heard me say, people say, I'm a good person, I have a good heart, and that's not what's gonna get us into heaven. And the only way we're gonna get in is the way, the truth, and the life, and that's following our Lord and Savior Jesus. I was Christmas shopping today, and on the way back I passed a funeral procession. I saw the police officers and the lights and then I saw the hearse and my immediate human heart reaction was to feel sadness because I've been in that line and it hurts. I felt sad for, for whoever that was and I always say a prayer. We do this with fire trucks too. If we see fire trucks go by with their sirens blaring, we say a prayer. And I said a prayer for whoever was in that line, the family that was in that procession line heading to go bury someone that they loved. And then I immediately felt the spirit switched. It switched something in me. And I, I felt, it's homecoming. I felt they're going home. And now I don't know if that was, if that person was a believer, but something in me, I've never felt that before. I've never felt, I've never felt it should be a celebratory thing. They're going home. They're gonna go meet the, they're gonna go see the face of Jesus if they're a believer. And I just, something switched in me today and it made me joyful. It made me joyful because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that is in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. God doesn't see death like we do. We go from life to life when we believe. So to see that what is such a sad moment for us here on earth, we think of our loved one as, as no longer being with us. But God sees them as coming home. God sees them as, you know, opening up his arms and welcoming his son or daughter back home. So I just switched my perspective a little bit today. And so now whenever I see a funeral procession in the future, I feel like I'm gonna have a little bit of joy inside of me. Obviously praying for their hearts because I know in that moment it's, it, it's hard and it's very, very, very painful and they will be in that grief. But the Christ follower in me felt joy felt joy for that person that they get to go home and be with Jesus. So I thought today I would just answer questions again. Uh, you guys like when I, I do this with you guys. So I just thought that's what we can do on this third Sunday of Advent. So here we go. Question one, what is it like in Texas right now? It's beautiful. I don't even need this jacket. It's probably in the, in the seventies. Maverick's actually here with me on the floor. Let's see if I can show you. He's just chilling. Hey bud. I'll show them to you guys at the end. So it's beautiful outside. Um, it's just great weather for December. It's crazy. What is it like in Texas in general? I grew up in Texas my whole life. I love this. I love this state. I love the people here. I love the food. 
I love the landscape. I love the schools. I love the churches. This is my home. This is my hometown. And so many people are coming here now from other places. And, and I love what our, our pastor says, Pastor Joe says, people get so upset when somebody comes to their hometown and it's like, well, our town is changing and it didn't used to be this way. And there's too many people and they just need to go back where they came from. And, and Pastor Joe and me, we see it as, guys, these are souls to bring to Jesus. These are souls that we can share the word with and share the good news with them and welcome them, welcome them. You know, if you want to come to Texas, come to Texas. It's a great state. We're running out of room. We're running out of housing, but you might have to build. But I love this state. I love Texas. So don't look at it like that when, when, you're, when your town gets crowded. Look at it as a, another person to minister to, another, another friend that you could have, another family member that you can welcome at your table. What is your favorite thing to get at Chick-fil-A? I love the bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit, y'all. I haven't got it lately, but I used to go in like every morning. <laughs> get the bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit, the granola yogurt parfait, and then if I'm going for lunch, I like the market salad with apple dressing. You can never go wrong with the chicken nuggets, though. I love the nuggets, too. But I'm not a big Chick-fil-A sandwich girl. I, like, never get that. Granger gets that. What are some names you liked but you didn't use for your kids? London was going to be London or River. Lincoln was going to be Kennedy or Luke. River was going to be Harlow. I always say this joke because my father-in-law, we said Harlow to him, and he, get, he said, have you said it out loud to yourself? Arlo. I just love that name. It sounds like old, old Hollywood. It could be a beautiful baby name and a beautiful old lady name. I love the name Harlow. Were you raised country since you're English? Where did you grow up? I shared on my Instagram story the other day this quality street candy that my grandmother had. She's born and raised in London. She came over here, married my granddad. She still had her English accent up until she passed away. I never got it. My mom doesn't have it either, but we do have English roots. I was not raised in the country. I guess it wasn't really city. I wasn't like in the city, but I wasn't in the country either. I didn't grow up in the country. And then as I grew up and graduated high school and in college, I lived in the city. I was a city girl, lived in uptown Dallas for a while. I mean, I did the whole city thing. So I didn't really become a goat, dog, chicken farmer until I married Granger. But I love this life and I, I couldn't see myself living in the city ever again. Where did you grow up? I said Fort Worth, right? I grew up in Fort Worth. Fort Worth is an, an amazing city too, if you've never been. The downtown area is great. Do you or have you struggled with body issues after babies? I think as a woman, I think we all, we all feel some sort of insecurity about our bodies in some way. And that's the enemy a lot of times, coming in and, and telling you, you need to be skinnier, you need to be prettier, you need to be smarter, all these things. I have really tried to welcome the changes of my body and I've birthed four beautiful, amazing, precious humans in this body. My tummy has been stretched out four times. I have issues because I wanna feel energy. I wanna feel good for my kids. It's not so much like I wanna be a certain size or anything like that. It's all about how I feel. So I hope that answers your question. I, I've never really struggled to the point where I, I was depressed or upset about, about my weight or my figure. I fluctuated, I gained 50 pounds. I gained at least with River and he was the biggest baby, which is weird. I gained probably 50 with Maverick. It takes you nine months to have a baby. Give yourself time if you want to get back in shape. I still am, am slowly trying to do that just so I can have energy and feel better. So focus on how you feel, not about how you look. How do you discipline your kids in a godly and effective way? There's a couple of scriptures here. Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. So the Bible says we have to discipline our children. And the Bible says God disciplines us because He loves us and treats us as His children. And if we're not corrected and not disciplined, then we can't be considered His children. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And you guys have heard me say this verse before because so many people pick out, yeah, you want discipline? So many people pick out the verse or the commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, but they don't They don't read the part that says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We have to discipline in a in a loving way. We always tell our kids, we don't do these things because you're, you're being punished. We do these things because we want you to become a well-rounded, likable, <laughs> faithful human being, um, responsible, knowing how to grow up and have a family of your own. We're trying to teach you these things so you can become good citizens in society. Proverbs 22, six says, start children off in the way that they should go or train them up in the way that they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. So discipline in our house looks like taking things away. Taking things away works. S spanking occasionally. I mean, it, but it, it doesn't take much to have our children listen. Um, we just try to always teach Manners, yes ma'am, yes sir, no ma'am, thank you please. We teach them 
what the Bible says about certain things. So if they're doing something wrong or something that's out of character or, or not a good behavior, we say, well, the Bible says this about that. If they say a bad word or something, well, the Bible says no corrupt talk should come out of your mouth. So we try to teach them in a biblical sense. We never really did timeouts. I mean, occasionally when they were super little, I just really try to talk my kids through things. Not so much like the whole gentle parenting thing because I don't, you have to discipline your kids. You can't just let them get away with anything or they're not gonna be good productive members of society, but we're not harsh. We're not harsh. I think we try to, to walk the line of biblical and loving and respecting and just trying to raise up our kids the best we can. How have you managed the loss of your son over time? I lost both my parents and I struggle. I know who you are. We've talked on Instagram. My answer is very slowly, one breath at a time sometimes, one minute at a time, one hour at a time, one day at a time. You'll look back and you'll see, like I can't even believe we're gonna be coming up on three years in 2022. It feels like forever when you're in it, but then you look back and three years have already almost passed. I've already almost been without River for the length of time that I had him. And that is crazy to me. I don't know your pain of losing your parents because it's a different pain than losing a child. I can imagine how hard that has got to be. And I'm so sorry, but it's one day at a time. It's on your knees and surrender in constant prayer and in the Word of God so that you have a close relationship with Jesus and you know that you have hope in Him. That's how I've managed to do it. That would be my advice. Lots of prayer and lots of Jesus. How can you lose a child and still thank God for what He has done for you? So this is all about a shift. Oh, buddy, keep crying, hold on. Hey. So this is all about a, a shift in perspective. Once I took all the focus off of me and, and turned it upward instead of outward, take it off worldly views and, and focus on my eternal perspective, it totally did a complete shift in my posture of my heart, in my prayer. How can I still thank God for what He has done for me? Um, did you open up your eyes today? Did you wake up with a new day with the sun shining? Did you get out of your bed with your able body? Did you go inside and make a cup of coffee, pull out some food? You had food to eat today? Did you get in a working car and drive to a job that helps provide for your family? All of these little things that we take for granted are all gifts from God. They are all things to be thankful for. And those are just the things of this world. Think about what He did for us that He didn't have to do. He gave His Son to be tortured and beaten and murdered for your salvation. So how can I thank God? Because He lost a son. That's how I thank Him, because His sacrifice for me overrides any sort of thing on this earth. You know, 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, we fix our eyes on the things that are not seen because the things that are seen are temporary and the things that are unseen are eternal. I mean, oh, Bobby, you're so sad. You're so sad. What's the matter? Yeah. Crying. You wanna sit with me the rest of the time? Okay, maybe you can see both of us for the last part. Like I said, I live my life in gratitude for His life. We're not promised. We're not promised an easy life with no pain. We are promised suffering, and Jesus told us that. As soon as we take the perspective off of ourselves and turn it up eternally, I promise your heart will change. I promise your vision will change. The things that you care about will change. The things that you believe will change. I just thank Him for every little thing. I thank Him, I literally thank Him now when I open up my eyes. God, thank you for the gift of another day. One day closer to being with you. I, I, I just, I lay down my life for you. <laughs> Excuse you. You know, I think about, he is so good and so faithful. Yes, we've gone through loss. Yes, we've gone through tragedy. Yes, it hurts. Yes, I still get angry. I still am sad, but he, is so loving and so just and so merciful that He still gives the people of this world who don't believe in Him, who blaspheme Him, who turn their backs on Him, He still gives them breath. Think about that. He's still sustaining them and still giving them blessings and they turn their backs on Him. So I just, I think about that and I just think about how we're such a teeny tiny piece in His grand plan, but how lucky are we that we get to play such a small part in His symphony. I just think that's incredible. So how can I still thank him? Because he is so good. He is so good, even if. How do you get your kids involved in learning about Jesus so that they can understand? Teach them the gospel, talk to them about what Jesus did for them, how much he gave up and how much he loves them, and take them to church. We take our kids to church. Sometimes they go to Sunday school. Sometimes they, or I say Sunday school, kid ministry. Sometimes they sit with us in worship. They see us worship. They hear us, they hear us talk about Jesus, they hear it, they see us read the word. We read Bible stories, Bible books that, that are fitting for kids. We watch Bible shows. There's one called Superbook that's really good for kids. We just talk about God all the time. We read the Bible in front of them and we sing Jesus loves me. I mean, something as simple as singing Jesus loves me to them lets them know that Jesus loves them and that Jesus lives in their heart if they if they accept him as Lord and Savior. 
I might have to take him inside. Okay, I just took Maverick inside so Lincoln can, can play with him for a few minutes. Our seven-year-old asked to get baptized. Speaking of Lincoln, this was somebody else's question though. What conversations did you have with London? So London and I got baptized together in 2020. She is, not to say that girls are more mature than boys, but she's a few years older than Lincoln. She knows her faith. She knows what she believes and why she believes it. And it's something that she wanted to do. Now, Granger kind of has a rule in our family that boys don't get baptized till they're 12. That's just something that the Smith boys have done. My main thing is, is do they know what they're doing? Do they understand what they're doing? Do they understand what they're professing? And we asked Lincoln, he said, I want to get baptized. And I said, well, why? Why do you want to get baptized? And he said, because it looks fun. And so as a seven-year-old, he doesn't know what that means. He just wants to do it. And I don't want him to, like I did, have to get baptized again 35 years later. I want to wait till he's ready, till he knows what he's doing, till he knows what it means. And it'll be something that he never forgets. I don't want him just to do it, just to do it. That's what we talked about with London and that's what we talked about with Lincoln. So it'll be a few years before he gets baptized. He loves Jesus. He has accepted Christ, but he doesn't really know what the baptism truly means yet. And I want him to know that in his heart. They just have a deal in our family where they do it when they're 12. So. Lincoln will probably get baptized when he's 12. How do I support my significant other through the loss of his father? We lost Granger's dad in 2014, and I hadn't been through any sort of true grief. I'd lost a granddad in 08, but I'd never been in, in heavy, heavy grief pain. Not to say that, that, that my grandmother and my grandpa were, were, were any um, less of a loss than, than my son. It's a different loss. So without having been through that, I didn't know how to support Granger. I was so scared to even talk about Chris because I didn't want to hurt him. I didn't know if he was having a good day and if I brought up Chris, if he would be hurting anymore. I regret that now, going through our loss of Riv. You want people to talk about your loved one. Don't be afraid to talk about somebody's loved one. If you're scared, just ask them. You know, say, say I'd like, like even now, I sometimes will text Granger before and I'll say, I just found a new photo of Riv, can I send it to you? I, w I don't just send it, because I don't want him to, to, I don't want to catch him off guard. So just, just talk to your husband, just say, hey, I was just thinking about this memory of your dad, can we talk about it? Ask him how he's doing, ask him what you can do for him. Try to anticipate his needs as hard as that is, but just don't be afraid to, to talk about him. Be there the best that you can. Hug him, love on him, acts of service, do things for him that will help him through his grief. Take him to church if he's, if he's willing to go with you. Pray over him, pray for him, because one of the most important things we can do is pray for our husbands and pray for their hearts, pray for their salvation, pray for their healing. Just do the best you can. You'll be able to kind of test the waters, but that's one thing I regret is I, I didn't talk about him enough and I wish I did. What is religion versus spirituality? So religion to me is is very legalistic and it's all about laws and things you have to do in order to get to heaven. And if you do this, you're going straight to hell. And, and if you eat this on a Sunday, you're, you're not following the laws. It's, it's all legalistic and it's all laws. Spirituality, in essence, it's believing in something bigger than yourself, not necessarily God, just believing in something, a higher power, a mystical figure, something that's bigger than you. I don't think you should be either one of those. I don't think you should be super religious and I don't think you should be super spiritual. I think you should have a relationship. I think you should have a relationship in a relationship with Jesus, the one true God, the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think you should open up your Bible and have a relationship with Him. Read His Word, ask Him to illuminate it for you, follow His commands, not so much necessarily following the law, but when you love Jesus and you are a follower of Him, you follow His, His commands in the Bible. You love your God above all else and you treat your neighbor as yourself. You love others and you seek Him every day and you worship. You worship for everything that He has done for you. You live your life in gratitude and surrender. So over religion and over spirituality, I value relationships. When is Granger going to become a pastor? You guys are so inspiring. I don't necessarily know if Granger will become a pastor per se. He doesn't have a vision of planting a church or anything like that. He just feels a calling from God and he's listening and he's obeying and he's, he's going where the Lord is leading him. So for now, he's a preacher. And if that leads into something else, we, we don't know. We have learned in these last few years that God works so mysteriously and so miraculously and so unexpectedly that we are just living our lives with our hands open and saying, okay, Lord, I trust you. I'm gonna follow you wherever this leads me. And I know if you take me here, you will lead me through it, whether it's good or bad. And I trust you with that. I'm living my life in surrender. I think that's all I'm gonna do today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Put some questions in the comments below if you have it for next time. I love answering y'all's questions. I get so many questions about how can I be close to God? How can I get close to God? And I love that question because that means that God's moving in your heart. That means that God is stirring something inside of you to want to know Him. That's the first step. If He's doing that, my main thing is to say to open up God's Word, open up the Bible, pray for Him to reveal Himself to you. Ask for forgiveness, repent for sins, give Him your life, 
accept Him, lay down your life and say, God, I want you to be Lord of my life. Take my life, do with it what you will. I trust you, give me the courage and the strength in every single season that you put me in, Lord. And I just want to know you. I just want relationship with you. So please come close to me, reveal yourself to me, and I will follow you. That's to me how you can become close with God. Obviously there's other things. You can go to church, you can join small groups, you can serve, you can, you can do all that stuff. But my first thing would be to get on your knees and just ask, ask, ask for Him to come into your heart. Because it's not something that I can tell you to do. It's only something that God can do. Only God can change your heart and and make you a true, true follower of Him. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you'll have a wonderful week. We're so close to Christmas and so close to the birth of our Savior. And that is just something to be so joyful and something to celebrate about. So I will see you guys next week. Have a great week. Go into the world and be the light, shine the light. I'll see you next time. Bye.